الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بعثه الله رحمة للعالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد today إن شاء الله تعالى we'll be covering the last class of the tree of Iman, Tawdih wal Bayan li Shajarat al Iman, clarifying the tree of faith and how the tree of faith is like a good word. And uh, thus far, we've covered the first two sections of the book, and today, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to cover section three. So quickly, let's just do a recap of section one. What did section one deal with in this book? Alhamdulillah. How you doing, Shaykh? Alhamdulillah. Okay, so... Yeah, so section one, we dealt with clarifying the definition of Iman. What is Iman? And uh, what, what is Iman? What do we say it is? Statement and action. So statement and action, but what, what does that mean? Statement and action. <coughs> okay, okay, so statements come from the heart and is made on the tongue. And what is the statement of the heart? What it, because again, this is not uh, regular terminology. This is not just something that every Arab is going to know. Qawlul qalb. So when you translate it into English, it's also not going to make uh, perfect sense unless you actually know what you're saying. So when we say qawlul qalbi, the statement of the heart, what are we referring to? Affirmation. To, to, to the affirmation, the, the true conviction in the heart of la ilaha illallah. Everything else, all of the other actions of the heart are built upon that conviction, right? So when we talk about loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fearing Allah, hoping in Allah, putting our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turning to him in repentance, all of those are actions of the heart based on what? The conviction of la ilaha illallah. So that's qawlul qalbi, or the statement of the heart, if you will, and those are Amal al-qalb, or actions of the heart. And then we have the statement of the tongue, what, is referred, what, what that means here is what? La ilaha illallah. And that is how, that is the asal of one's faith. That is the foundation of faith. That is how a person enters into the fold of Islam. And then after that, we have actions of the tongue, which are those actions which can only be performed by the tongue, like kira'at al-Qur'an, reading the Qur'an, dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, dua and otherwise like and then you have actions of of the limbs and your salat your hydra and so forth like so uh, again to recap then we say iman is statement and action that's the the summarized version of that definition like uh, part two section two of the book what did that deal with? Developing your iman and increasing and increasing your iman. Tell you, the author started out with four ways that iman is increased. Who remembers them? Okay, so knowing by you knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will have iman, and the more that your knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grows, then the more that your iman increases. Tayyip. That's number one. And that is the basis of all of the ways that you are going to grow in faith, is your knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How, how do we know Allah? Through his, tayyip, through his names and attributes. Tayyip. And, that, and, and we find those where? In the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, in the Hadith. So therefore, knowledge of the Quran and reflecting over the Quran, knowledge of the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that's two and three. And then four is what? Huh? 
Number one is now knowing Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know him through revelation, which is the Quran and Sunnah. So that's two and three. So knowing the Quran, reflecting over the Quran, and knowing the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. And then number four is the one who conveyed the revelation. The one who conveyed the revelation. So knowing the seerah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Those four, in terms of knowledge, are the best ways to increase in faith. The objective of revelation is knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else is a branch of that. So that's the objective of revelation. The revelation itself is Quran and hadith of the Prophet And then knowing the one who conveyed the revelation, which is number four, which is knowledge of the Prophet sallallahu his seerah, his shama'in to the end of. So it's important that we, if we were to sum that up, if we were to sum up section two, which is how do we increase in faith, then we would say that we increase in faith through two means. One is beneficial knowledge, and the second is righteous actions. And again, that should always be in our minds because we need to be looking at, at every chance you get, is what I'm doing right now beneficial knowledge? Is what or gaining beneficial knowledge is what I'm doing right now a righteous action? If it's not, then my man is not increasing right now. If it is not, then my man is not increasing right now. And then you have to look at, well, am I doing something that is opposite, which is decreasing or weakening my faith? And so a believer never wants to get to that level. Yes, there are times when you will not be increasing in faith. And that is okay. That is okay. That should not be the majority of your time, though. When the Prophet ﷺ told his companion, Sa'atan for Sa'a, it's a time for this and a time for that. It's going to be a time when you're not doing these things that are going to make your iman increase to the sky. <coughs> but that's not the majority of the time. There are times when you're just going to be doing things that are mubah or just permissible. <coughs> And if you can turn those into things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that'd be great. But if not, it's okay. But you don't want to get to the point where you are doing what? Weakening your faith. Where you're doing those things that weaken your faith. And so, what do you think if we could generally categorize the things that weaken faith? What are they? Let's sum it up in two. Sum it up in two things. As we covered it last week, but we kind of glazed over it, so I, I want to make sure that we we get it down this week. Sin. sin. Okay, sins. Uh -huh. <coughs> Disbelief. Disobedience. Diso disobedience and sin, same thing. Disbelief. All right, so hold on. Let, let's take a step back. What increases faith? Beneficial knowledge. Righteous actions. Okay. So these are the things that strengthen your faith. The things that weaken your faith are actually the opposite of those. And these are what are known as the two ways that shaitan enters upon the heart. Which are shubuhat and shahawat. Shubuhat and shahawat. So the shubuhat, which is what? It, 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 those, those are doubts, misconceptions, which is the opposite of beneficial knowledge. It's those things which causes a person to have doubt about anything that he shouldn't be doubting about in his faith. So those are shubuhat. That is the unbeneficial knowledge. And then you have shahawat, which are your, your lust and those lowly desires that cause a person to fall into the opposite of righteous actions. and leads a person down a path of disobedience and sin. And any time a person is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a degree of them taking their own hawa as an ilah. You've not seen the one who has taken his own desires as his ilah, as the one he's worshipping. Because at that point, at that point, he is putting his uh, desires over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's putting his desires over Allah. And that's why it is quite important to know what weakens faith so that you can what? Avoid. So that you can avoid. Tight. 
All right. You said they were already flowing, huh, Shaq? You need to get the juices flowing? No. Okay. I'm going to pour them out now. Right. Questions for lesson seven. Let's do it. Questions for lesson seven. What is the main difference between the second and third sections of this book? Sum up section three in two sentences or less. Hey, right. we got that? All right, because I, I want you to be able to do this by the end of t tonight, inshallah. Does Iman prevent one from entering the fire? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Does Iman prevent one from entering the fire? They should? According to the devil, some will take you out of the fire. We all want it. Okay. Go uh, All right, all right. Go ahead, Victor. According to the author, what essential quality is necessary to secure a good life? What is the foundation of all that? Yeah, so, so this here, this question here, I really want you to focus on that because... Uh, again, I mean, we're talking about this tree of faith. And one of the, and so section three, just so that we're very clear, what is section three about? Section one was about defining Iman. Number, section two was about developing that Iman and growing it. And section three is about what? Bearing the fruits. Bearing the fruits, the fruits. Because now we know what the tree is. We planted it. We developed it. We want to watch it grow. And then we want to what? Harvest. We want to, we want to get the fruits, right? So, so one of the fruits that he's going to talk about is that good life. Do you want to live a good life? That, that I, I want to be happy. I, I, want to, I want to taste the sweetness of, of this life and the sweetness of the next. But what is it that I need to secure a good life? And then on top of that, what is the foundation? Because there's a relationship between the two questions. What is the foundation of? Istiqama. And what does istiqama mean? Uh, okay, so f for those of you studying Arabic with Sheikh Hanif, what's the three-letter root of istiqama? Hmm? No, 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 no. We're going to take off the ist, right? It, like istighfar and that. Uh, no, istighfar is ghafara, is the three-letter root. Istiqama. So, so 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 we have a cough, an aleph, and a meme, but it's actually gonna it's gonna, it's gonna be a cough and a yat and a meme. So so you have the word, but I, it's like from the from the arkan of salat, right? You face the qibla, right? It's the it's of qibla, all right. And then it's what when you're standing up, what's that called? Qiyam. Qiyam. Right. So istiqama is like you are you are requesting al qiyam if you can be. Something is qa'im, it's upright. It's standing straight. So al istiqama is when you're straight, when you're on that straight path. What is the foundation of istiqama? Right. What two blessings does a mu'min, that is a believer, enjoy or I left it as mu'min for a reason. Right? Because a mu'min is one who has iman. The mu'min is the one who possesses iman. So what two blessings does a mu'min enjoy during times of ease? Mm. Which of the two is greater? Yeah. What are the requisites, that is the requirements, for the validity of one's deeds? Is it okay to seek leadership? Oh, okay. So, so what are the requisites for the validity of one's deeds? Uh, okay. Requirements. <laughs> Uh, 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 it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. How, how many are there? Let, let's start there. Two. 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 I'm glad everybody said two because it's three. Play it. <laughs> is it okay to seek leadership is the last one. Alhamdulillah. Play it. All right. So this is actually the author's introduction to uh, section three. We're going to read it and then we'll summarize some, some important points. Mm -hmm. Nine, the benefits and fruits of faith of Iman. Many indeed are the fruits and benefits of correct faith, both temporal, that is temporarily, and everlasting in body, 
heart and spirit, in this life and the next. Plentiful indeed are the ripe, mature fruits of this tree of faith. It's delectable, that means it tastes good. It's delectable of harvest, perpetual food, and enduring good contain matters that cannot be enumerated, can't be counted, and benefits that cannot be restricted. Right, so, so let's, let's just stop there. Here, the, the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and, and I want to, I, I, because I'll probably forget by the time we get to the end of the book, but the author, uh, Abdurrahman bin Nasir, Sa'idi Rahimahullah, he wrote this book in 1374. He died in 1376, right? So this was just two years before he died that, that he authored this book. And, and you look at that sometimes as, uh, as a scholar, you know, develops in his own right. Um, that is, he reaches a certain level where his knowledge is, is stable. Uh, you, you like those books. And, and, and this makes this book really special. And what you're going to find here, this collection of, of 18, as he says here, that, that they cannot be enumerated. The, the benefits of Iman cannot be enumerated. The author took a stab at it here and listed 18. Not because he's trying to tell you that these are all of the benefits of faith, but because he wants to give you some of the fruits that do what? If you know, like somebody loves mangoes, right? Or somebody loves apples, and they say, I can actually have one of those in my backyard. I just have to plant the tree. Then that's an encourage, that's one of the things that encourages you to plant that tree. So when you know the benefits of true Iman, that is one of the things that pushes you to develop and to grow your faith by just knowing what some of the fruits are. So the, the author here is giving us just the taste of some of the various fruits that come from the tree of Iman so that we'll be more encouraged to grow that tree and to, <coughs> and to make sure that it's irrigated properly and to keep on pushing so that we grow and develop it. You understand? So these are, the, these are some of the points. Not that he's saying that these are all of the points. And the author, like I said, the author mentions 18. I had to choose eight from the 18. Um, so that we could actually get through them, inshallah ta'ala, today. And, and I'll tell you, as, as, as my shaykh, Shaykh Abdul Razak al-Badr, Hafidullah ta'ala, said, uh, the last time I studied this book with him, which was 1435, so that was four years ago. At that point, he said that he had taught the book ten times. This was in 1430, this was four years ago, 2014. He said he taught the book four times, uh, excuse me, Ten times. He said, and each time I teach it, he said, and I encourage you to level it, and I encourage you, students of knowledge, to read this book frequently. Don't think that you're going to get everything out of it by reading it once. He said, don't think that you're going to get everything out of it by reading it once. You need to read this book multiple times. And that's when he said, I taught this book ten times, and each time I teach it, I benefit something from it that I did not get prior to this time. And then he taught it again in 1436, and then he taught it again in 1437, which was two years ago, and I'm not sure, I, I don't think he's taught it after that, but the point is that that would be number 12. And that he didn't get tired of teaching it. And the reality is, is that the majority of this book, if you were to look at the words of the book, that the majority of the book is Quran and Sunnah. It's just a matter of categorizing the ayat and categorizing the hadith of the Prophet and then looking at the way that he extracts the benefits from it. And so I'm saying this now so that just in case I forget later, don't stop reading this book. Let what we've done through these last seven weeks uh, or these last seven classes, let that be something that opens up the door for you to understanding the book, right? And then go back and read it yourself. And if you have questions about it, then ask those questions that you have about it. And go back and read it again. Because this is what this life is about. This life is about acquiring faith, developing that faith, reaping those fruits in this life, and then reaping them in the hereafter. By way of summary, the author of Iman, Sayyidi Rahimahullah Ta'ala, 
all goodness in this life and the next, and the repression, that is the tamping down, of all evil ensue as the fruits of this tree. So, uh, so again, if we could, if we, if we're going to summarize chapter or section three, section three is all about the fruits of faith. It's all about the fruits and the benefits of faith. And as the author here says, everything that is good in this life, everything that is good in this life is a result of Iman. And everything that is good in the next life is a result of Iman. And all aversion of evil in this life is a result of Amen. And all aversion of evil in the hereafter is a result of Amen. So there's no way that we can sit up here and, and actually enumerate the fruits of faith. But as you'll see, inshallah ta'ala, the ones that we've uh, chosen will at least open up the door for us to, to see how in reality everything that is good in this life and the next goes back to Amen. And everything, all aversion of evil in this life and the next are from the fruits of this tree. Now. This is because when the tree is implanted firmly, its roots become strong. Its branches distend, that means stretch out, and blossom, and its fruits ripen. It brings benefit both to its owner and those around it. Now, subhanAllah. So what, what, we're, go what we're gonna see here, inshallah to Adam, you know, Even on a regular tree, like a, a tree with that, that has fruits, like mango or an apple or something like that, does er, is everybody able to benefit from that tree in the same way? Why not? Okay, people have different tastes. No, no, no. Let's say uh, the person loves the fruit. Sorry? Body composition. Body composition is different. So this person is tall. He just goes like this. He pulls it down. Another person is short. He needs something else to be able to benefit from, from the tree because of his body composition. There are other people who do what? They don't just like it. They sell it to other people. Right? They may manufacture. They may have a multitude of trees and this person only has one so when we talk about iman it's similar not all people are going to benefit from the tree of iman the same way and that's because people vary in their degree of iman and so just like in the hereafter i don't know if you remember one of the first lessons that we covered the first or second lesson the pro we, we covered the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu talked about the levels of the believers in Jannah and that some of them would be looking at others as if they were distant stars. The Prophet Sallallahu said what? لِتَفَاوُتِهِمْ وَلِتَفَاضِلِهِمْ yeah, Because of their varying levels of Iman, that is how they were in the hereafter. Likewise in this dunya, when we talk about the fruits, not all of the believers are going to get all of those fruits. And not all of them that get the fruit are going to be able to benefit it, benefit from it in the same manner. And, that, and that, I hope that's clear, and inshallah, it'll become clear as we go around. Type. Uh, just to summarize real quick, at the bottom, what do you see here? We see the branches. The branches of Iman versus, that is, on the other hand, the fruits of Iman. All right, so here we're going to cover that. So if we, if we look at... If we look at here where it says developing and in, ooh, sorry. Developing and increasing Iman. Next to that it says a human action, right? You see it? Right here. It's not in your book. You don't have to worry, you're not gonna find it in your book. Okay, it says developing and increasing Iman. That's a human action. In other words, you are required to do something to do what? To develop your faith. Okay. But the fruits of Iman, these are the rewards from that. And those rewards come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So if we look at the major difference between section two and section three, and that's why I told you all, we're going to spend the majority of the time on what? On section two. Because that's what you have to do. That's what we have to do. We have to take part in, in, in growing and developing our faith. Of course, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to aid and assist. And to make it easy for us, right? But the fruits are more that we know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward those who do number two. Those who strive to develop and grow their faith, this is going to be their reward. And by knowing the fruits, inshallah, it will also be a reminder for us of the importance of section two. And remind us of what our disposition to be, should be at certain times if, in fact, we are our believers. So uh, just to, to summarize there, uh, it says the benefits vary greatly from person to person, which we just talked about. The benefits that a person gets from Iman, the fruits that they get vary greatly from person to person. Why? Based on their level of Iman. Based on their level of Iman. Number two, that the fruits of Iman are innumerable, which we spoke about. And number three, that this list is unique. And what I mean by that is that I'm not aware of any other book that you can just pick up, especially not a book of this size, that you can pick up that is going to list for you the fruits of faith. This book is special. And I am not, you know, one to have given it its due. But I hope that at least it'll be an encouragement for you to read it again and again. And inshallah, maybe at a later date, you know, we'll, go, we'll come back and revisit it and, and, and teach it again. Bid me left. Now, play of shake. So, uh, again, I was a bit selective. Um, like I said, the, the shake mentioned 18. Some of them I combined because, not because they're exactly the same, but because they're similar enough that we can read them together and come out with a, with a uh, comprehensive benefit. So we're going to start with number one, which is also number one in the book, which is attaining the wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's on page 63. So if you have your books, I would recommend that you open your books and read along because we're going to do a little bit of skipping. Attaining the wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatest, the greatest of all matters, that is to be competed for it, is this and the most noble of all matters to be acquired by those granted the divine reward is this, meaning the wilaya of the law. Exalted is he who says, Shaykh. Translation means, yes indeed, the friends of the law will feel no fear and will know no sorrow. Those who have faith and show taqwa. Now, so, so here, the, the author begins by mentioning that the first fruit of faith is that one attains al-wilaya. And al-wilaya, uh, it, it means that a person is under the, that special guardianship, that they have a special relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah Azza wa Jal says here, Ala inna awliya Allah, la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. The awliya of Allah, the, the awliya, the, that's the plural of wali, and the wali is one who has attained wilaya. That they won't have any fear. La khawfun alayhim. Yani they won't have any fear for what is in front of them. And they don't have any sorrow for that which has happened in the past. What is the description of the awliya? They are those who have iman. And they had taqwa as well. Iman and a taqwa. And a taqwa is actually a part of, a part of iman. And taqwa, when it is mentioned along with iman or it is mentioned along with bir, it refers to staying away from that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Which is why some people translate it as fearing Allah. Because 
that fear prompts them to stay away from that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when it is mentioned by itself, taqwa is inclusive of bid, it's inclusive of iman. And these words are used like that as we talked about earlier with iman and al-amal al-salih or faith and righteous actions. Uh, keep reading, Shaykh. Uh, keep keep uh, reading. Uh, get, page sixty four. Just keep reading. Therefore, every yeah. therefore every pious, God fearing believer is a wali, friend and protector of the law, being gifted with the specific special wilaya. Allah says about such people. الله ولي الذين آمنوا يخرجهم من الظلمات إلى النور. Sorry, I had to skip that. <laughs> Allah is a friend and protector of those who have faith. He brings them out of the darkness into the light. So Allah, it's Allah. Allah. That oh, is, I E stands for it is. That means that is. He leads them out of the darkness of disbelief. All right, all right. Let's uh, let me let me let's stop right there. Allah Allah is the wali of those who have iman, of those who have iman. And in the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaha wa zakkiha anta khayru man zakkaha anta waliyuha wa mawlaha. And really, you should memorize this dua. This dua is really important. Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaha. Let, let's, let's just go over. He's saying, oh Allah, ati nafsi. Give my nafs its taqwa. Ati nafsi taqwaha. Oh Allah, give me taqwa. And make me a muttaqi. Wa zakkiha. Anta khayru man zakkaha. And purify it. Yani purify my soul. You are the best of those who purify. Anta wali you have. You are the wali of my nafs. Anta wali you have. Wa maulaha. And it's guardian. So you are, you are the wali of my nafs. And, and this is interesting because what is a wali? It's, it's, that, it's that special friend. It's a special. So. La ilaha illallah. And you look at these are two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the way. Al-Wali and Al-Mawla. And the, the meaning of that is that Allah Azza wa Jal yatawalla al-abd, al-mu'min. Yani he protects his believing servant. And, and this, inshallah, when we, when we do get to the next course, inshallah, which begins on September, what is that, Shay? The 18th? 23rd? Uh, it's the I think it's the 18th inshallah September 18th is when the next uh, course 10 weeks inshallah when we deal with the asma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and some of his sifat we're going to cover al-mawla and al-wali but just to know right now that from the meanings is that Allah azza wa jal protects his believing servants and he he gives them that divine aid so that they worship him properly and that they and that they are uh, truly his servants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaha wa zakkiha anta khayru man zakkaha anta waliyuha wa mawlaha Nah. Uh, where, it is, where, where is it? Allahu Akbar. Yeah, that's it. Um, but it should, it's not hard to find. It's in every book of dua, inshallah. Nah. And soon in every da'ud, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> he leads them nah, nah, out of the that. darkness of disbelief into the light of faith. Nah. From the darkness of ignorance into the light of knowledge. From the darkness of sin into the light of of obedience, from the darkness of negligence into the light of alert wakefulness, no. from the darkness of all evil to that which would remove it of the light of good. Right, so here, so here, the, the author, uh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he goes on to kind of just itemize 
certain aspects of darkness and then the opposite because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them to the light. So he takes them away from the darkness of kufr, of disbelief in him, or of idol worship, and he brings them into the light of iman, and he takes them out of the darkness of ignorance into the light of what? Knowledge. And he takes them out of the darkness of disobedience and sin into the light of obedience and pleasing him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, and he mentioned here, and I, and I think this part is important too, it's very important that he mentioned it, and that is that he takes them out of the darkness of negligence. Because sometimes it's not that a person is just sinning or that a person, is, but it's just that they're heedless. But they're not conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he brings them to a state of consciousness, that they're alert. And, and you see what happens in Ramadan, right? When a person is striving, you become, there's this heightened awareness of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that doesn't exist during other times. You never want to get to a point where you're just totally negligent and totally heedless and totally not remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is what is going to lead to the other things, disobedience and otherwise. So this is what the author talks about here. And in his tafsir uh, of the previous ayat, which is on the board here, where it says, Allah, la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. Uh, he says that when, if a person has no fear and they have no grief, then the opposite of that is that they're going to have what? That they're going to have security. They're going to feel secure. They're going to have that emin, that safety that they're looking for. And they're not going to have any sorrow, which means that they're going to have happiness. And so the awliya of Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal blesses them with those feelings of security, feelings of happiness. And this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's from the tree of Iman. And the people who don't have Iman, they won't have that. They're not going to have that. There's going to be something empty that they're searching for, and they just won't have it. Nah. Nah, Shay. There's a lot that can be said with life. It's, uh, However, they only deserve this precious gift Allah by Allah. virtue of the correct faith. Right. And they're actualizing it through taqwa, for taqwa is from the completion of faith, as has been previously discussed. Okay, look directly right now at the next page, page 65, towards the bottom. It says, Allah defends the mu'minun. And, and, and the reason why, and we're not going to read this, the whole point, part there, but the point is, yeah, go ahead, read it. Just read it. If he presses from them all that they would like, all that they would dislike, and delivers them from all hardships. Allah, exalted is he who says, translation means, Allah will defend those who have faith. Right. He will defend them by saving them from all that they would dislike, the evil of the shayateen and men from the attacks of their enemies. He will defend them by repressing harm, from afflicting them, or, or lightening, lightening it, or removing it after it has and so you, you, I want you all to go on and, and read these, uh, read this part. But it's very close. Once a person attains the wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they will get that portion, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes their, their protector. And so he's going to defend them. And this is why, you know, it's, it's very important that Sometimes you have to take a step back. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't defend your own honor. It does not mean that, obviously, that if there's a physical altercation that you need to defend yourself and your family, that you don't do so. That's something that you have to measure at that said time. But also to recognize that many times you throw off Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's defense of you because you want to defend yourself. You're not accepting Allah Azza wa Jalla as being your wali. You're not, so now you become the one who's going to defend yourself. And a lot of times it's a very fine line between are you defending yourself for Islam? Or are you defending yourself because of your ego? And is it actually that you are doing something that is self-serving? And so it's very important that, that a person walks that fine line and strive to be from Allah's 
awliya. Because if you're from Allah's awliya, من آذى لي وليا فقد آذنته بالحرب. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever harms a wali of mine, then I am announcing war. I'm declaring war against them. And if Allah declares war against somebody, you can forget it. And so it, it's important that a person really strives that they become from the awliya of Allah. Because if you get to that level, you really don't have anything to worry about. No. No, I'm sure. Page 65. No, just, read, just read from here. Read straight from here, Shay. Security from the fire. Faith, even if, it, even if it is little, prevents one from, eternity, from an eternity in the fire. Whoever has complete faith, such that he, he or she fulfills the obligations and leaves the prohibitions, will not enter the fire. All right, so we have, two different, we have two different issues here. We have complete faith, and we have faith. Those who have complete faith, if a person has complete faith, there are two things that the author here mentions that, that are going to happen. Number one, he's going to fulfill all of the requirements that he has. And he's going to avoid the prohibitions. And so if he fulfills the, is the, the requirements, the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated, and he stays away from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, then he has completed faith. However, that does not mean that that completion of faith is complete. Meaning that there are even levels of that as we talked about, right? We talked about the believers being three different levels. Those who oppress themselves. Al-Muqtasid is the one who travels a middle course. The middle course has completed faith. The one who travels a middle course has completed faith. He won't enter the fire at all. He doesn't enter the fire at all. bil khayrat, And those who race to do good... Those are on another level of having completed faith. And even them, they vary significantly. Because a person who stays away from all of this harm, and he does all of that which is required of him, and he also prays, for example, 12 extra rakats in a day. Okay? And he gives sadaqah every now and then. And he makes umrah from time to time. And he makes hajj every five years. And he's good to his parents and so forth, right? This person is a Sabbath, Bil Khairat. But he's not like the one who makes Hajj every year and Umrah twice a year. And along with the 12 Rakats, he also prays Qiyam al Layl and he does Duha and he gives Sadaqah on a daily basis. And he's good to his parents in a way that that person is not. That's another level, but they're both Sabbath. But again, and so that's why we talk about those different levels in Jannah. That's going to be based on a person's actualization of faith in, in this life. And so faith, even if, be, even if it is little, the smallest amount of faith prevents a person from eternity in the fire. But it does not necessarily prevent a person from entering the fire. Well, the other that. Because we, we don't have the ability to, there's no patience with the fire. There's no, I can, I can take it. No, not even, for, not even for the blink of an eye. And so, but, but because of the, the, the strength of man, and because of how blessed that fruit is, it prevents one from eternity in the hellfire. And those who have complete faith, will not ever enter the fire at all. That's Allah. Yaj'alana min al-mu'mineen al-kumma. From the complete believers with complete faith. No. Hmm? Okay.
Probably fuck with shit. Go ahead, go ahead. This, this has been narrated via Mutawatir, uh, continuous reports from the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, just as it is reported from him that none would remain eternally in the fire who has even a little bit of faith in his heart. Right, and here what we have to understand is that the Iman that is being talked about here is the Iman that we talked about in the first section of the book. Because there are some people who claim to have Iman, but the Iman is not going to benefit them at all. This is, we're not talking about a little bit of faith from those type of people. Wala yu'minu aktharuhum billahi illa wa hum mushrikun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the majority of them will not believe in Allah except that they are mushrikun, except that they are idol worshippers. And so there's faith and then there are things that nullify a person's iman. And those things have to be avoided in totality in order for the faith or that iman to have any benefit. And so iman along with shirk does not benefit the person who claims to have faith. And that's why it's very important for us to understand this point. Because there are a lot of people that say, oh, I believe in God. But that's not the faith we're talking about here. We're talking about the iman of la ilaha illallah or Muhammad Rasulullah. Because what did we say? The, the basis of faith is what? Faith that is where? In the heart. Okay. And then we said that is qawl al qalb. That is the statement of the heart. And what is that statement of the heart? La ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. So if a person doesn't have that and understand what that means and that that prevents idolatry and those other things that nullify iman, then it doesn't benefit them. It does not benefit them. I hope that's clear. Because not everybody that says that they are a believer, that belief or that belief or, or their iman is not necessarily going to prevent them from eternity in the fire if it did not make them actually Muslim in this life. So those are some of the topics that we covered when we before when we talked about tekfir and what takes a person outside of the fold of Islam, which would be a whole another discussion that is much longer than what we intended in this in this particular uh, uh, study, inshallah. Tayyib Sheikh, follow. Peace of mind. Okay. Okay. Go to page 67. 67? Page 67. Correct. Uh, the, uh, the translator here uh, says a good life in this world and the next, which is correct. That's not, that's not wrong. But if you want to look at what the fruit is here, the fruit is peace of mind. That you get peace of mind. That as a result of your iman, you now have tranquility in your heart and peace of mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ Look at that. Anyone who does righteous deeds, male or female, being a believer. That is, he is a mu'min. فَلَنُحْيِيَنَّهُ حَيَاتًا طَيِّبًا Then we will give him a good life. Then we will give him a good life. What, 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 what conditions did he lay out for the good life? It says what? No. الْعَمَلَ الصَّالِحِ Righteous deeds and? And, and iman. Righteous deeds and? Amen. If you have those, you'll have a, a good life. Hayatan tayyiba. Wala najaziyannahum ajrahum bi ahsani ma kanu ya'malun. And we will give them the reward of that. We will give them the reward for what they have done according to the best of what they used to do. Where is that reward that he's talking about in the last part of the ayah? Ayyuh. Exactly. In the hereafter. In the hereafter. All right? So he says, he says, we will give them a good life. That's where? Now. now. 
and we will reward them according to the best of what they used to do in the hereafter. So that's why he says a good life in this world and the next. Like, read, read, with, read the, uh, this is the because, books. Uh -huh, yeah. This is because faith engenders, that means helps to grow. Peace and tranquility of the heart, contentment with that which Allah has provided one with, and, has, and is, he is not being dependent on any other. Mm -hmm. This is good life in the truest sense of the word. Right, and so then there's a part that the translator missed, and it comes in Arabic, and it's the part where at, at the bottom where it says the foundation of the good life is peace of mind and the absence of confusion and doubt. The foundation of the good life. Oh, you see it, right? Yeah, it's there. The foundation of the good life is peace of mind and the absence of confusion and doubt. SubhanAllah. Um, it, it's not in the, it, they didn't translate it, huh? It's there in Arabic. Yeah, it, it was missed. But, but I think that sentence is, it's, it's um, imperative. I think it's one of the most important parts uh, of the book. And that is that the foundation of, the good, of good life is peace of mind. When we talk about Allah says we will give him a good life if he does what? Has faith and righteous actions. As we know, righteous actions are part of Iman. So it all goes back to Iman. If you want a good life, that good life is predicated on Iman. But what does a good life mean? It means that Allah gives you peace of mind. What Arabic did he use for peace of mind? Uh, he says, al itmit nan. Wallah Adam. Let me see. He says, uh, al itmanina, right? Which page is that on, Shaq? Oh, wow. Okay. Ayo, ayo. Call it for in the usl of Hayat al Tayyiba, Rahatul Kalbi, what a man in a two. Right. So. I took the liberty of translating it as <laughs> peace of mind. Rahatul qalbi wa tamaninatu. Wa adam wa adam right? Because here, here he talks about the confusion and the doubt that comes to the person who is faqid al iman, the one who doesn't have any faith, the one who has no iman. He's going to be confused all the time, and the doubts are going to come. And and there's a term. Um, just to, and then we're gonna we're gonna skip to page seventy nine because there's a there's a connection here. But the the idea of of keeping one confused, right? This is there, there's a term there's a term called gaslighting. You ever heard of that? A manipulate a manipulation tool that is used by dictators and narcissists and other people who want to control people. And, and part of that is keeping them confused about their own identity, about their own well-being. So for example, the person just lies to your face. And you know they're lying. But they're so bold about it that you start questioning yourself. Because if this person was lying, well, how could he do it like that? Like, I couldn't do that. If I was lying to somebody, I couldn't do it the way he's doing it. And so you start questioning, and they do it so many times, it, it leaves you what? Always off kilter. But then they tell you the truth sometimes, compliment you other times. So what happens when you deal with this person? You're always off balance, always confused. And that's how they manipulate you. The human being naturally wants stability. You want to be not confused. And the only way that comes is through Iman. That's the only way it comes. And this is how you get that good life. You know, the good life is much more mental than it is physical. Much more mental than it is physical. Which is why you can find people who have many possessions and they're not happy. And you can find people, yes, there's a certain level, according to the science, if you will. There's a certain level that a person needs to have. That is their, their basic 
needs and things like this. If a person doesn't have them, a lot of times it's going to be very difficult for them to be happy, right? But the point is that you'll find that people with a lot less means, and you'll find them very happy. You'll find them very happy. Uh, I, I knew a person who, who was very into material uh, things, thought that they needed to have all of this, and they wanted to have this and the best car and the best. And then they traveled to a third world country. And, and came back and told me about it. He said, I've never seen the people so happy. He said, their, their, their house, their, their houses are like rooms in this country. The, the whole house is like a room in this country. The, the entire house could fit in the, in the living room of, of this particular person. They walk everywhere. Very few of them have cars. And when they do have cars, these are not, you know, the, the luxury or but they're very happy people, subhanAllah. And it was a Muslim country, the third world country was a Muslim country. But the, the, the point is that, that it is not the material that creates the, the peace of mind and that tranquility in the heart. And it definitely doesn't bring about the absence of, of confusion. So, so we see the importance of having peace of mind in, in order to have a good life, and that it is, that is the result of one's iman, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them that. Because, because what? It is their faith that connects them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that connection is which gives them that peace of mind. Go to page 79 quickly, inshallah, and then, and then we'll talk about how that ties in to this. Allah exalted his seat. 315. Uh, yeah. Doubts are laid to rest. Uh, translation to be the believers are only those who have had faith in Allah and His Messenger. You tell which one that memorized. Huh? That's plagued many people. Or oh, the translation means the believers are only those who have faith have had faith in Allah and His Messenger, and then have had no doubt. Doubts plague many people and end up being a detriment to their religion. <coughs> However, correct faith represses, puts out, clamps down all doubt. Indeed, it effaces it that makes it disappear altogether. Faith comes back. Let's skip to the last sentence. This is why it is established in the two sahibs. This is why it is established in the two sahibs on the authority of Abu Huraira, that the Prophet said, People will persist in asking questions until it will be said, Allah created the creation. So who created Allah? Mm -hmm. Upon this say, I believe in Allah and the Qumilu Billah. Desist and take refuge with Allah from Shaytan. Mm -hmm. Right. So the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned three ways to cure this destructive disease. Number one, desisting from continuing these whispers of Shaytan. Number two, taking refuge in the evil of one who, the one who implanted them, that is the shaitan. And number three, holding firm to the protection of correct faith by saying, Amen to Billah. Amen to Billah. I have believed in Allah. Whoever seeks protection with it will be from those who are made secure. So here, uh, what we see is the, the author is talking about the doubts, right? Here, we, how, does, how does one attain a good life? Through what? Through Iman. The opposite of that is, is that is kufr, obviously, but that kufr starts with what? It starts with that doubt. And so the reason why I brought this up is because what happens is, as the, as the hadith mentions, a person will continue to ask, okay, who created this? Who created your parents? Who created them? Who created until the, until they say, okay, well, who created? Allah. Which is it, which is a question that's like saying. How, how, how can there be a round circle? I mean, how can there be a round square? I mean, it, it doesn't work. The question itself doesn't work. But, but that's... The question itself is nonsensical. But we can deal with that at a different time because that wasn't the point of bringing this up. The, the, issue, is, the issue is that, number one, and, and this is important here, a person who wants a good life should not subject himself to doubt. That is, don't put yourself in a position where you feel like my man is strong and I'm ready to just debate with anybody and I can handle the, the greatest 
you know, debaters. And, no, don't put yourself in that position in the first place. And for those of you who have children and, 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 and your children are going to college and these type of things, to put them in the class, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, because this is from experience, not, alhamdulillah, not my own children, but from helping other people. Those philosophy classes are problematic, especially for the children who do not have firm faith. And so they go in and they will make a person question their own existence. How do you know that you exist? How do you know that you are not a figment of your own imagination? I mean, no, really. They, this is the, because philosophy is there to push those limits. And so a person comes out many times, many times, having at the very least doubt about their faith, right? So don't subject yourself to that. That's number one. But number two, and, th and this is also what I wanted to, to discuss here, is that the root of your istiqama, of being upright in your deen, is the ability to control your thoughts. That, as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala talks about, he talks about it in a very important book of his called Tariq al Hijratain. He talks about the root of istiqama. What is the foundation of you being upright? It is the ability to control your thoughts. Because it is your thoughts from which your actions are bred. Because thoughts turn into intentions, and intentions turn into determination, and determination turns into action. And so if a person has the ability, so what happens initially is that all of us get thoughts, right? So we get these, uh, or we get these, uh, what's before a thought even? You just get passing ideas, whatever, to come to your mind. Okay. You can choose to allow yourself to continue thinking about that thing, or you can stop. And see, so every evil act started out as a passing thought that you entertained. I wonder what it would be like to be with her. Hmm. And then you think a little more. And then that thought turns into a, hmm, maybe I should get the number. And then, it, you, you see? But if you just cut that off, I would be letting the shape on I'm not even thinking about that. If I think about it, it's going to open up the door to do what? For me to start to intend something. And then you have to, and then once something becomes an intention, it takes a lot more to repress it. You understand? Once something actually is like, I'm intending to do this thing, even though Allah is with you, out of his mercy, if you intended to do something was wrong and then you stopped yourself, it's written as a what? As a good deed. Allah Akbar. Allah gives you all the way up until there to reward you for not doing something that is evil. Out of his mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but the believer, Allah, you learn how to control those thoughts. They come, you let them go. Don't entertain something that is not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to know that Allah knows what you are thinking is important. Because then you should have some haya. That's where the shame comes in. It's not just the shame that comes from doing something. Because you can sit in a room with somebody and totally have a whole haram encounter in your mind. And the person never knows. And they sit up there and they think that you, you're listening to the cookbook. You had a whole something going on. And the person. <laughs> no, but it's true. But, but the reality is, is, if you have higher, if you have real shame, if you have that real bashfulness, and, 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 and you're shy, you're shy to think about. What is haram? Because you know Allah knows what you're thinking. And so that is very... I think that this might be when it goes out. See, it went out here. Oh, no, no, it should be all right, inshallah. Just make sure that they can still see it. 
Hi. So we have. Uh, Again, <laughs> the continued, uh, the continued faith demand is challenged daily. Yes. But each individual, no matter how strong you think it's a continuous challenge to the day that you die. To, on, on the day. Right. So, so it's not guaranteed daily that you can be continuously faithful mm -hmm. and you can be, end up in the hellfire because something distracted you. Right, and so Jazakallah Khairan for that point. And that is that is why just and, and, and this is why you think about it like you think about a tree or you think about it like you think about a plant. That plant needs constant water. constant irrigation. It needs to be looked at over constantly. Even if you don't have to water it every day, you might have to pull up the weed. You might have to take the ivy off. You might have to make sure that it's in a in a certain that it's getting a certain amount of sunlight. Cultivate. You have to cultivate. And that's that faith. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order to help us preserve our faith, because Allah Azza wa Jalla does not benefit from our worship, He prescribed that we pray five times a day. That's part of that protected that because that prayer in Allah Azza wa Jalla called prayer in the Quran what? He called it Iman. Makan Allah. Allah would not cause your iman to go to waste, meaning your salat. That salat is the greatest pillar of Islam after the shahadatain. It is that constant nourishment of that of faith. But the point is definitely well taken and it's correct. And that is that that is that without constant nourishment, that the tree will die. And so, and, and, and your faith is like that tree. And so you do have to be on top of it. We have 13 minutes. I don't know, subhanAllah, how we're going to do this. Bismillah. Fadl Oh, yeah. Validity and perfection of deeds. The law says, translation reads, but as for anyone who desires the hereafter and strives for, for it with the striving it deserves, yeah. being a believer, the striving of such people will be gratefully acknowledged. Right. Striving for, continue on? Yeah, please. Striving for the hereafter implies enacting all that would draw one close to its comprising all. To it, comprising all those actions. Close right. to it, comprising all those actions that Allah has legislated upon the tongue of his prophet, Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam. However, if these actions are missing the essential component of faith, even if one were to devote, you got it? Even if one were to devote himself to performing deeds day and night, they are unacceptable. So, so, in other words, and we'll just go through this quite quickly. Like I said, brothers and sisters, you got to read this book. And you got to take it, go back to the beginning, soak it in, read it with someone perhaps. Because a lot of times that, that helps for it to sink in when you read with somebody. Um, so here, the point is that Iman is a is the main condition or prerequisite if you will for a deeds being valid and then the more that the iman increases the more one is rewarded for those deeds because the deeds become more correct more uh, or they, they reach a level of completion or perfection so here the, the author brings the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ For he who wants the hereafter. Meaning that the deeds that a person does, he does not do them desiring any reward in this life. He does them desiring the reward from Allah. So his deeds are sincere. So the first condition mentioned here is al-ikhlas. That a person does whatever he does sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't want his reward here. The person who shows off 
doing a deed. They want to be what? Praised. praised. And praise is a reward in this life. Not a reward in the hereafter. So that excludes them from this. Woman arada al akhirah. He who wants the hereafter. Wasa'alaha sa'yaha. And he strives for it appropriately. As the scholars of Tafsir have mentioned, that this means that they do it according to, according to what Allah has legislated upon the tongue of the Prophet So in other words, the deed is sincere and it complies to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we have ikhlas and ittiba, right? Here is sincerity and following the sunnah of the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam. Those are two. But number three is, wahuwa mu'min. Wahuwa mu'min. That he has to be a believer. That this person has to... So, it is conceivable, it is conceivable that a person would perform hajj. They do it as the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, did it. And in that particular instance of doing it, they're not looking for any worldly reward. They want a reward in the hereafter. But when they performed the hajj, they were not in the fold of Islam. They just went out. Maybe they worked for CNN, for example. They just want to follow. They got a crew with them following them in camp. But they themselves are not looking for any worldly gain from it. I'll give you another example. The ones that are out, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about them in the Quran, he says that إِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعَوُ اللَّهَ الْمُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ When they are out there on that boat and the waves are coming strong and maybe their boat is going to be capsized, they say what? دَعَوُ اللَّهَ الْمُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ They call upon Allah مُخْلِسًا with true sincerity. Is the deed accepted? Allah may answer their dua but that doesn't mean that they that the deed itself is accepted from them. Allah answers the dua of Christians, Jews, Buddhists. Nah, it's true. A lot of people's duas, a lot of people's prayers are answered. And those ones, they called upon Allah with sincerity. It was, a, it was what? It was answered. But that doesn't mean that the deed is accepted. That means that there's no reward for them for that deed in the hereafter. And this is why the author brings the next statement. He says, so he says, however, if these actions are missing the essential component of Iman, even if one were to devote himself to performing these day and night, they are unacceptable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَدِّمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مِنْ ثُورًا We will come to the actions that they have done, and they will be like, and we will make them like scattered dust. Make them like scattered dust. And uh, there has to be more talk on that subject later. Uh, but the point is that it is only the believers whose deeds will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, next. Gratitude, the guidance, gratitude and patience. Right. Allah guides one to the straight path. 3.7 is that Allah, Allah guides the one with iman to the straight path. Right. And 3.8 is? Comfort during adversity. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal will allow their iman to comfort them at times of adversity. Right. Gratitude during ease, patience with adversity. Right. So we're going to read very little of this, but let's just go to page 70, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, here, the author says 3.7 on page 70. He guides him towards learning the truth, acting by it, Accepting all beloved things with gratitude and facing trials and hardships with contentment and patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ladina aminu wa aminu salihan, yahdihim rabbuhum bi imanihim. For, for those who have faith and do righteous actions, their Lord will guide them by their faith because of their faith. Because of their iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them. Wallah azza wa jal yaqub ma asaba min musibatin illa bi idhnillah. وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبَهُ Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, There is no misfortune that occurs except by Allah's permission. Whoever has iman, وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ 
Yahdi Qalbahu, whoever has this Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will guide his heart. Some of the Salaf said in explanation to this verse, it refers to one who is afflicted with a misfortune. But he knows that it is from Allah that any adversity that comes to him, whether it's health or loss of loved ones or, or any other type of adversity, it, it afflicts him, but he knows it's from Allah. That's, that means Allah guides the heart. Because of that iman, he knows that it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and therefore he's content. And he accepts it. He's content, and he accepts it. Right. 3.8. One is comforted at the onset of calamity and hardship. Here, I, I want you to look at this one statement where the author says at the end of the first paragraph, he says, the sweetness of the reward mitigates the bitterness of patience. A person, a, a person, patience is actually bitter. Uh, a suburb. There's, there's a, a, another word very close to it, which is a sabira, which is the aloe. The aloe, how does it taste? Bitter. Super bitter. bitter. Aloe is super bitter. And so sabr, they say, is bitter. It's, it's being, you know, patient when, when adversity comes. It's a hard pill to swallow, we, we say, right? It, it's, it is. It's a bitter thing. But the knowledge of the reward that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sweetness of the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lessens the marara. It lessens the bitterness of the patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In takunu ta'lamuna, fa inna hum ya'lamuna kama ta'lamun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling the believers, if you are facing some pain, we're talking about during battle, you are facing pain. For inna hum ya'lamuna kama ta'lamun. They are also facing pain just like you're facing pain. Don't think that you're the only one. Just like they're getting some up, some on you, you're getting, you're getting some up. But, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? What tarajuna min Allah, ma la yarajun. But you hope from Allah that which they do not hope for. That's the difference. They, they kill one of your men, you kill one of their men. They kill two of yours, you kill two of theirs, whatever it might be. But the difference is what tarjuna min Allahi ma la yarjun. You hope from Allah that which they have no hope for, they can't hope for. Because they have no iman. Because they have no iman. And so here, the comfort that comes to the believers at the time of adversity, because of their iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them that comfort. There's nobody that's going to get their reward in full except for the believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That's the reward of the, the believers. Give good tidings to, to the believers. And that's actually one of the uh, subcategories that is that is mentioned here. One of the fruits of Iman is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them this bushra, glad tidings. Glad tidings of what Allah doesn't mention. That means all that is good will come to them. Give them the glad tidings. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is upon them, that is the sabirun, those who have sabr, it is upon them that they will have salawat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa rahmah, and mercy from Allah subhanahu Wa uh, that, that Allah sends salat upon a person means that he is going to praise them actually. In Al Mala al A'la. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them amongst the uh, amongst the, the highest level of, of angels. Now is that it's time for the day, huh? Tayyip. We're going to start reading 3.14. Go to 3.14, which is page 78. Gratitude in times of ease and of patience, of ease and patience at times of adversity. It is established in the Sahih that the Prophet Ali wasalam, said, Amazing indeed is the affair of the believer. All of it is good. If he is in times of ease, he shows gratitude. And this is good for him. When he is in times of adversity, he is patient and steadfast, and this is good for him. This only applies to the believer. It's only the believer. Uh, and, and some of the other narrations actually comes first. So the Prophet says, 
that amazing indeed is the affair of the believer. All of it is good, and that is only for the believer. That is only for the for the believer. And uh, it's just it's just not enough time. You, we could cover the subject of sabr and shukr, or what we're translating here is patience and gratitude. That could be its <coughs> own ten week course, honestly, because uh, as Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala uh, mentions that the entire uh, deen goes back to a sabr and shukr. And so he asked Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, which one is better? He asked his Shaykh, Shaykh al-Islam. He said to him, oh Shaykh, which one is better? The one who is wealthy and, 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 and thankful or the one who is poor and patient? And Shaykh al-Islam said, the one who has the most taqwa. <laughs> Now, so here, um, yeah, he says, gratitude and patience gather together all good. And the believer is acquiring this goodness at all times and profiting in all circumstances. No matter what's happening, whether you're living through good or the times are difficult. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're both tests, and that's the thing we, a lot of us don't realize. We think that when, we're, when, when the times are going good, that it's not a test. It's a test. It's a test. You, you, went, you got to... A hundred percent increase, you know, in your salary, and you're like, times are great. What are you going to do with that extra money? You're going to use it to disobey Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, or you're going to use it to do something that is good? It's a test. We will test you with evil and with good. Fitna. It, it's all a fitna. It's all a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that is to see, are you going to be thankful for those blessings that you got from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which requires you to use them in a manner that is pleasing to him and not use them in a way that displeases him? Or are you going to be ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hungry? And, and then... The shar, everybody recognizes that as a test. When evil comes or adversity comes, they say, I'm being tested right now as a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We call it that, inshallah. Uh, We're going to move through these, inshallah. In Sahih is reported that the Prophet Sallallahu said, the believer is not afflicted by any concern, worry, or harm. Any concern. That is, the, even the mental uh, anguish that a person deals with, the worry that a person deals with, or harm, that it is physical and bodily harm, except that it would be a means for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expiating his sins. So at the times of ease, the believer attains two blessings. Ready? The first is that it is a time of ease. That is a blessing in and of itself. The second is that he is blessed or that he is given the divine guidance to be thankful 
and to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show his gratitude for that blessing of ease. And that second blessing, that is being guided to gratitude, is greater than the first blessing. The blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guiding you to being thankful is greater than the blessing of ease. And is greater than the favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may have given you. At times of adversity, the believer attains three blessings. First is expiation of his sins, as we just covered in the hadith. Number two is that he is granted sabr. And sabr is ibadah. Sabr is a great act of ibadah. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides a person to that uh, expiation of uh, uh, afwan, of being patient, is a blessing. And also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the adversity easy for him to deal with because of his iman. So it lightens the blow. And he's able to handle it. And this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go back to page 73. And that is that through Iman, a person attains the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azawajal says, Inna ladina amanu wa amilu salihat, sayaja'alu lahum ar-rahmanu wudda. As for those who have faith and do righteous actions, they have Iman and righteous actions, which are part of Iman, the All-Merciful will bestow His love on them. And so, Allah, because of that Iman, and because of their righteous actions, Allah will love them, and he will place the love of them in the hearts of the believers. As it comes in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when Allah loves his servant, Nada Jibreel, he'll call to Jibreel, and he'll say to him, Inni uhibbu fulan and fa'ahbibhu, I love so-and-so, so love him. And if, when Jibreel finds that out, then he also says the same thing to the uh, inhabitants of the heavens and informs them to love Fulan, so love him, and then his <coughs> acceptance will be put in the, in the land. And that will be for the other believers who are loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are on that path. They will love this individual because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has loved him and he's attained the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here it says, whoever is loved by Allah and is loved by the believers, he will find victory, success, many benefits, commendation, that is, he'll be praised by them, supplication for him. They're going to make dua for him while he is living. Hafidhullah ta'ala. Wa faqahullah to the end of it. And after his death, when they'll be asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy for him and expand his grave and so forth, people will follow his example. People will follow his example and he will attain leadership in the religion. What is the benefit of people following his example? The benefit is that when his example is followed, when people do things because of him, then he also gets their reward. You understand? Because now they're following his example and now he gets the reward for all of the good that they do. And he will attain leadership in the religion. This being from the greatest fruits of faith is that he becomes a leader in the religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We appointed leaders from among them, guiding by our command when they were steadfast and then when they were certain of our signs. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he, he wrote an entire book just on this ayah where he talks about the four qualities that a person needs to have to attain an imama in the religion, to become a leader in the deen. And that book is called Risala uh, Ibn al-Qayyim li ahadi ikhwanihi. Uh, the letter that Ibn al-Qayyim wrote to one of his brothers. It's very, the title is very um, ambiguous. But the, the book in its entirety deals with this, with this ayah and, and breaking down those four qualities. So he says, guiding, number one, is that in order to be an imam in the deen, that you have to strive to guide others, that you have to strive for them to be right, that you have to command what is good and forbid what is evil. That's part of it, that you guide. But not any guidance. Guiding 
Yahduna bi emrina, by our command, that is according to our teachings. Qul hadihi sabili, say this is my path. Ad'u ila Allahi ala basira, I call to Allah upon basira, which is insight and that knowledge. So a person guides by Allah's command. That's one and two. Yahduna bi emrina, lamma sabaru, when they were steadfast persevered and so sabr is that third quality and they had certainty in our signs and certainty is that last quality and certainty is that highest level of of iman and so here these four qualities will propel one to being a leader in in faith and leader in the deen. Tayyip, the two questions. What are some of the worldly benefits of being loved by Allah? We talked about it here. A person gets victory and success. They'll be praised. People will make dua for them. These are worldly, these are worldly benefits. Tayyip, is it okay to seek leadership? Is it okay to want to be any man in the deen? Huh? Didn't the Prophet Sallallahu say, La tes alu imara? Don't ask for leadership. Don't ask to be an emir. Don't ask to be in charge. If you are given it without asking for it, well, ain't. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, give, will, will help you, will help you in that position. But if you, if you get it because you asked for it, then, then you're not going to be helped. Didn't Yusuf say, alayhi salatu wa salam, put me in charge of the treasures of the, of the earth. Didn't he ask for leadership? Is it okay to ask for leadership? Or do we need to push that off to a different day? How much time we got? None? <laughs> the, the, the quick answer is there's a difference between leadership in worldly affairs and leadership in the deen. There's only one way to become a leader in the deen. And that is through those four qualities. You need to be calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen in the manner that he prescribed you need to have sabr. You need to have yaqeen. So you strive for those qualities. You strive for those qualities, you will automatically become an imam. Not that you're seeking it. You will become that. Because you have وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imam, And that's one of the duas that the muttaqeen make. And make us a, an imam for the muttaqeen. Make us an imam for them, meaning make us be from amongst them who are the leaders of the muttaqeen. Because we, we have embodied this taqwa. As for worldly positions, then that is only permissible under cer in, 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 in certain, with certain restrictions. As was in the case with Yusuf والسلام, where he knew that by being in charge that he would bring salah and righteousness and so forth and that by others being in charge that it would become corrupt and that the people would be destroyed. Type, securing the law's gifts, the greatest of those gifts uh, being, or not necessarily the greatest, but one of the greatest of those gifts is what's talked about at the end, which is that light that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he says at the very last paragraph, therefore the believer is one who walks through the life of this world by the light of knowledge. And see, subhanAllah, through your iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you basira. He gives you that light that you need to be able to distinguish and to be able to prioritize. And these, uh, that, that is the light that we're talking about here. And he will give it to you on the day of judgment when all lights have been extinguished. He will traverse the bridge, the sirat, guided by his light and enter the abode, abode of, perpetual, of perpetual bliss. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on the day you see men and women of the believers with their light streaming out in front of them and to their right. And then the munafiqun are going to say to them what? Let us take from your light. Say, go back there and go look for that light. Go back there and look for light. This is the last one here. And that is that faith prevents the servant from committing destructive sins. If a person finds himself committing major sins, then know that there is a major hole in the faith. A believer a true believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala avoids major sins like the plague. It does not mean that they won't make mistakes. Everybody is going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean that they're not going to sin. Every believer will sin indeed. But those major sins, 
mean that they are major holes in a person's iman. Wallahu al musta'an. What branch of faith is key in securing this fruit? It says here, whoever falls into committing such transgression, it is because of the weakness of faith, the loss of its light, and the removal of the sense of shame in the heart, al hayat which goes back to what we talked about earlier. If you want to avoid those major sins, you take control of what? Your thoughts. And that will control your actions. Bi'idnillahi ta'ala. Wallahu a'lam, we're going to test ourselves quickly. What is the main difference between the second and third sections of this book? Huh? Quickly. Section two deals with what? Developing. Development of faith. And that's what? That's my action. Section three deals with what? The fruits of faith. And that's what a, that's a law's action. Right. We sum up the section three in two sentences or less. We'll say that every good in this life is from the tree of faith and all repelling of evil is from the fruits of the tree of faith. Does Iman prevent one from entering the fire? Yes and no. Complete Iman prevents one from entering the fire. Some Iman prevents a person from eternity in the fire. According to the author, what essential quality is necessary to secure a good life? What is it that is the foundation of the good life? It is peace of mind. And what is the foundation of istiqamah? It's controlling the thoughts, right? And so you see that really your good life all is starts your, your thoughts and rahatul qalb that you have tamatnina and that you are able to control your thoughts. That this is, this is the essence of good life. What two blessings does a mu'min enjoy during times of ease? He enjoys the ease itself, and he enjoys gratitude. gratitude. Which of the two is greater? Gratitude. gratitude. That you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you to being thankful. What are, because some people might get that ease and use it to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the requisites for the validity of one deed, one's deeds? Iman, ikhlas, and mutabah. Iman, sincerity, and the compliance to the sunnah of the Prophet is it okay to seek leadership? We just talked about that. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa alhamdulillah. Alladhi bi ni'matihi tatimu salihat. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has uh, blessed us to complete the explanation of this book in a very summarized way. And again, I want to encourage you all to continue to read it. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for my shortcomings. Subhanakallah wa bihamdika shahadu wa la ilaha 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 il